The pyramids at Giza have never ceased to be a source of fascination since their conception and construction. Many in the U.S. dream of visiting these wonders of the ancient world. This is a civilization that lasted at least 3,000 years for the Pharaonic dynasties and probably a little more before that and a little more after that. But think of a culture that goes on for that long and preserves most of its basic tenets. Any civilization that can be that organized to produce monuments like this, these are the ultimate project management challenges, right? Think of what goes into building them. Where were these people housed? Where were they fed? How did the planning happen? How did more people get drafted? Where did the materials come from? Was it local? Was it brought from far away? How did this whole thing get organized? This bespeaks a great centralized organized culture. And it's one of the great cultures of the ancient world. Founded in 1889 by David Gordon Lyon, the Harvard Semitic Museum works tirelessly to understand, preserve, and learn about the languages and cultures of the Near East. Our founder was David Gordon Lyon. His view was to try to create a museum and a teaching department that encompassed all the languages and cultures of the ancient Near East. So by Semitic cultures, he meant ancient Egyptians and Mesopotamians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Israelites, Phoenicians, everybody. Well, the Semitic Museum is a place that we are revitalizing now. So our mission has changed a little bit, but it's remained the same in that we're trying to promote these wonderful civilizations of the ancient Near East, or what some people would call the Middle East. And we want people to see where writing originated, where these cultures came from, what does kingship mean, what is an empire, how do they rise and fall, how did these different cultures influence each other. Over the past few years, the Harvard Semitic Museum has incorporated technology to further its mission and create an engaging experience for its visitors and students. In our galleries, we feel that we'd like to combine the ancient materials and the modern materials. So to try to excite the visitor with new technologies so that they can learn more about the ancient pieces. Sometimes you might have a fragmentary pot or a bit of an inscription, but if you can restore that digitally, or point your phone at it and see the discovery photograph, or maybe read the text about it in Japanese if you're coming from Japan. These are all ways that we can enhance the visitor experience, and that's what we're working toward here. And I see the Giza project as coming in under the umbrella of the Semitic Museum. So the Giza project has as its goal to gather all the archaeological materials from Giza, the notes, the photographs, the publications, the drawings, the architectural sections and renderings, everything. So basically all Giza all the time. A good example of that collaboration is we recently fabricated or reproduced an ancient throne that belonged to the mother of King Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid. So we had the old plans and drawings and notes. From that, we built a digital model of this throne or chair. And from that, we used computer-driven milling machines to actually carve real cedar wood and create this chair full scale and gild it with gold sheeting and bake reproductions of ancient blue faience tiles and inlay the entire chair. So there's a good example where the ancient archeology, span the modern technology, the Giza project have all come together and they've produced a museum piece and you can see it here on display in the Semitic Museum. The Semitic Museum has created a 3D reproduction of the Giza Plateau. You'll see all the major monuments of Giza, the three pyramids of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaure, and the Sphinx, and about 15 tombs built in detail. The rest of the tombs are basically placeholders and we're waiting to do them in a little bit more detail so that you can go inside and see every inscription, view every statue, and learn about anything that might grab your interest. And we are using computer graphics programs to rebuild the actual tombs and temples based on the archaeological data that was acquired during the excavation period from 1944 back to 1904 or from later expeditions in the modern era. We started in partnership with a 3D modeling company in Paris called Dassault Systeme. And together we've been building these tombs and pyramids for about six years now. And as we started to build these tombs and temples, we asked ourselves, well, are we recreating the condition from the fourth dynasty, say 2400 BC? Are we trying to recreate the condition in 1912 when George Reisner and the Harvard MFA expedition found it? Or are we trying to show it as it looks today? And the answer is all of these. Sometimes the surviving nature of the data makes the decision for you. 
Would it be great to restore all of Giza back to its original appearance? Absolutely. But we have to do this in an archaeologically responsible manner. But once we've built them, we still have the problem of how to show them to students and people who are interested in the subject. So there we take our models and we bring them over to our visualization theater. The theater is a designed special purpose classroom, seats 16, 18 students, um, and is fronted by a very wide angle immersive screen. This screen uses two very high performance projectors to put up the equivalent of a 4K image on this very wide angle screen. This provides a sense of immersion for the students. For Harvard University students, this virtual reality experience is a great supplement to their classic lecture-based classes. Well, the Giza Plateau is a very special place. It's one of my favorite places on Earth. But you don't get a sense of the scale of the pyramids without going there. So none of this 3D virtualization, visualization work really is meant as a replacement for visiting the antiquities, for going to Egypt, to seeing these incredible places. But it's an enhancement, it augments things. So initially, this was our best case for getting the students out to Giza on a virtual field trip, put them in the virtual classroom, high performance projectors, 3D glasses, because with our computer graphics, we can design them in 3D. Or we can bring our full imagery that's photographed either from drones or from the ground, as well into the 3D theater and present it to the students. So it's something to teach a lecture course and show beautiful slides of the Giza Plateau. It's another to bring the students into this immersion experience where they put on 3D glasses and they can actually see the site in 3D and restore it at different points in time. When the students first get exposed to the 3D visualization of Giza, there's definitely a wow factor. And I will confess that sometimes I wondered because if they've grown up playing video games with these tremendous production values, you wonder if you could match that, what they've seen in, uh, in Indiana Jones movies or Star Wars movies, you know, how do you compete with that? But I think we have one advantage and that is that this stuff is real. This is a real reconstruction of an actual ancient civilization. And so that never ceases to amaze them. And I think it gives them an added dimension, a way to sense the scale of the place, when we put avatars or animated characters in the scene, it's something they can relate to. It gives them a sense of purpose. Oh, that's what that room was used for. Oh, that's what those people are doing. And I think it's a, it's a tremendously novel way to bring the majesty of the site across and, and uh, the functions of some of these buildings and, and try to bring ancient Egyptian culture alive. Harvard University is trying to share the wealth by exploring how virtual reality technologies can be incorporated into the fabric of a regular classroom. Today, um, educators are taking a page out of this old book as to how to use 3D images and uh, distribute them in the classroom through um, using the mobile phone, which is the new device for delivering this type of imagery, which almost every student now has or has access to. So images from all over the web, from YouTube, from Google, from Facebook, wherever you can retrieve them now in this 3D format can be displayed on your phone and viewed with a 3D headset. And they range in quality from something that's a $10 or $15 headset up to something that's $50 or $100 that gives you better capabilities. But this allows you to view both still images and motion images, um, and they can be structured into lessons and follow a, a given syllabi, or they can simply be used in an exploratory way for students as they are sort of searching for answers. The Harvard Semitic Museum has taken a great step in making such a rich civilization accessible to us all. Well, our visualization lab is a special place, but it only has 18 chairs. So it's a great question, how do you bring this material to the masses? So through websites, that's one way. And in fact, we do have a website where you can click a button and on your laptop it changes to a 3D mode right on your own screen. The next level is to put on one of these stereo headsets and have a 3D immersive experience. And we're trying to prepare those as well. So my vision is imagine an entire class all connected to the very same 3D model. So we're all standing in front of the Sphinx and perhaps I'm giving a lecture there and you could be plugged into this model from anywhere in the world. So the number of students is unlimited. It could be in the thousands 
And when we finish the Sphinx, I say, well, push button number two, and we go inside the Great Pyramid or into a particular Mastaba tomb and look at an inscription there. So this technology is here. It's ready. We just have to put it all together. Now we must take the baton and learn from the mistakes, mysteries, and genius of the ancient Egyptians. I think we have a lot to learn from studying ancient Egyptian civilization. What they did, we might look at as right. What they did, we might look at as wrong. Uh, what jibes with our concepts today of uh, justice and what doesn't. But along the way, we learn of a value system and a religion, how we treat the living and how we treat the dead. And there's a lot that we can mine from archaeological sites like this and learn along the way. As more and more knowledge is available at our fingertips and the future looks bright ahead, we must never forget to look and learn from our past. Music